thanks all for coming. It's an honor to be here with everyone tonight. Um, this is the launch, the New York launch, of David Rodiger's Class, Race, and Marxism, which is a new essay collection that actually comes out on the 4th of July. So this is a special preview. Um, so this book is a book that's anchored in the scholarship and the contributions of critical whiteness studies, which uh, Dave is, you know, one of the most preeminent scholars of. Um, it's a book that takes as a starting point that race is not outside the logic of capital and that solidarity is not easy, but it's worth our time, attention, patience, and study to, to figure it out. Um, the book consolidates many difficult questions that have emerged about race and class since the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement and the political fault lines opened up by the 2016 U.S. elections. Um, you know, like, there's, signif there's a lot in the book about the Bernie Sanders campaign and even specific responses to Ta-Nehisi Coates' article about reparations, so, yeah. So in this moment where we're still trying to figure out what to do about our current political situation, um, it has a lot to offer about, you know, what just happened. Um, I want to introduce all the speakers. Obviously, we have Dave Rodiger here. I keep going in and out, I'm sorry. Um, David Rodiger's work over the past 25 years has set the agenda for the work on the constructions of race in U.S. history. Um, his books have defined the field of critical whiteness studies and have been hailed by the likes of Angela Davis, Kimberly Crenshaw, Paul Gilroy, and Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak. Um, he's currently the Foundation Distinguished Professor of American Studies and History at Kansas University. Among his books are Our Own Time, History of American Labor and the Working Day, How Race Survived U.S. History, and The Wages of Whiteness. Um, we also have Jordan T. Camp, um, a term assistant professor of American Studies at Barnard College. He recently published Incarcerating the Crisis, Freedom Struggles and the Rise of Neoliberalism with UC Press. And he's the co-editor of Policing the Planet, uh, which Verso published in 2016. Um, I'm also honored to introduce Donna Murch. Donna is the Associate Professor of History at Rutgers and the author of Living for the City, Migration, Education, and the Rise of the Black Panther Party in Oakland, California. She is the author of the forthcoming book, Asada Taught Me, State Violence, Mass Incarceration, and the Movement of Black Lives, Movement for Black Lives, which comes out this fall from Haymarket Books. Um, and last but not least, we have Christina Heatherton. Um, she is newly assistant professor of American Studies at Barnard College, um, and also, along with Jordan, co-edited Policing the Planet. She's the author of The Color Line and the Class Struggle, The Mexican Revolution, Internationalism, and the American Century. So we're gonna start off with Dave speaking and then all the panelists will speak for 10 minutes. We'll have a general discussion and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Thanks a lot. Thanks everybody for coming. I didn't think, I, the wisdom is that New Yorkers all leave on the 4th of July, so I'm very <laughs> delighted to have this many people here. Is it, can it just be louder? I can get closer to it, yeah. Um, so thanks for coming, and thanks for the introduction, and thanks, Sophia, for all your work. I don't know if people know, but this is your absolute last day, last hours on the job at first, and she's moving to uh, other wonderful things. <laughs> So I'll start, um, I think a lot of you are probably thinking, uh, where can I get that shirt? Um, <laughs> just to answer that, this is Ryan Redcorn, the Osage uh, artist and comedian in the group uh, 1491 that's been doing some great, great, yeah, they are really fabulous, so. And, and which makes the shirt be about Osage oil wealth as well as, uh, Oil capitalism in the in the United States. It's a, he's doing some really brilliant, brilliant things. Um, I want to start with last weekend. I, I went home with this book. I'm the only panelist who doesn't have the book because uh, I gave away my last copy, my last advanced copy. I don't even um, uh, to my mother, who's 95, and she looked at it. She lives in Southern Illinois, uh, 
kind of an ex-school teacher and uh, uh, union leader uh, in this little town, and she looked at it and she registered immediately the Marxism part of it, and, she's, and she said, oh, Marxism, uh, that's always been your practice, hasn't it? And one of my friends uh, tried to convince me she said praxis, but I think she, I think she said practice. practice. Um, but and it was kind of a, mm, not exactly an endorsement, not exactly not. She's a left liberal. Uh, but she registered it, and it was delightful to me that she, um, that she did, because there's some controversy about how my work fits into Marxism. So I want to talk about Marxism and claiming Marxism for about 10 minutes, and then maybe I'll talk about the book itself for about 10 minutes um, as well. I've been interested in um, who among us who realizes that Marxism needs extension, critique, uh, confrontation with uh, what Walter Rodney called other forms of social inequality, uh, social oppression. Uh, those of us, some of us who ha come out of the Marxist tradition and who work our way toward that um, stance, uh, contention, some of us continue to claim Marxism and some of us don't. And I don't think it actually, ends, at the end of the day, uh, has a great deal to do with how Marxist we are or how much meaning we can wring out of Marxism. So that, for example, uh, Lisa Lowe, I think, is the preeminent Marxist thinker on race and class and gender uh, and migration and citizenship in the United States and doesn't call herself a Marxist for, I think, very private reasons. Her dad was a great Marxist historian, and I think there's a family reason that she decided that she'd stake out her own, uh, her own claims and her own territory. But nevertheless, she rings more from Marxism than almost any of us who call ourselves Marxists could do. I think um, this is true of Cedric Robinson, although people increasingly, because black Marxism is a part of the title of that book, uh, assume that Cedric must have unambiguously claimed Marxism. And of course, he didn't, uh, he, or he didn't always. Um, so I, I think it's interesting to think about uh, a range of people, some people in subaltern studies, Lisa, uh, who know more about Marxism than many of us who call ourselves Marxists do, uh, and who um, very much take off from Marxism, but don't use that term. And then there are people who have equally strong critiques of some of the limitations of Marxism where uh, race, race and gender and sexuality are, are concerned, but who choose to continue to call ourselves Marxist and to claim that that's a central part of the Marxist tradition, this rejuvenation and critique and extension is itself uh, central to Marxist practice. Um, so uh, I'm thinking of uh, David Canfield uh, the Canadian, uh, the Winnipeg uh, Marxist scholar who's doing this wonderful work on uh, queer intersectional uh, Marxism. Uh, I'm thinking of Sylvia Federici. I'm thinking of, in the past, C.L.R. James and, and uh, W.E.B. Du Bois who presented challenges to Marxism that could have been a divorce from Marxism, but instead they chose to cast their critique as an extension um, or, or at least as a, as a friendly dialogue uh, with Marxism. Uh, Rod Ferguson, the great queer of color critique scholar, uh, so much is identified with qu queer of color critique that I think it's sometimes realize, not realized that he, Rod writes as a Marxist. And many of the people who critique um, post-colonial and post-modern uh, writing can't see, they're so, uh, concerned with his uh, articulations of identity and his extensions of Marxism into the realm of queer of color critique that they miss the Marxism 
uh, all together. Now, the one person I'm going to talk about um, for a, a moment uh, tonight in that connection is the uh, Canadian economist Michael Lebowitz. And I really owe to Verso the fact that I started to read Michael Sebastian Budgeon told me, oh, you have to read his Deutscher Prize uh, lecture. And Michael won the Deutscher Prize, arguably the most distinguished Marxist scholarly prize uh, in the world. And he chose to give this extraordinarily challenging Deutscher Prize lecture in which he said, he didn't contest the fact that for a person in the 1860s, Marx had very good racial politics relative to his time, that he was anti-slavery, that he didn't believe in it, mostly in the biology of, of race. All of that, he, that he uh, had extraordinarily good and revolutionary views on the Irish question. But what Michael argued was that all of that was wonderful, but didn't influence the theory. And so at the level of theory, Lebowitz argues, uh, he's an economist, so he argues that you actually need another variable in the equations in capital. And that other variable is the necessity to divide workers. That a part of the logic of capital is to keep workers divided. And so in contrast to all of us, myself included, who ten have tended to write about race and class as if race were outside, and David, David Harvey says this very explicitly, as if race were outside the logic of capital altogether, Lebowitz is trying to argue, and he extends this argument in a book called Beyond Capital, and this week writes a cool little article on the internet called Hats and Men that kind of summarizes the same uh, set of, of ideas. Uh, and the ideas lead us to, to ask whether it might be the case that uh, the production of difference, what Lisa Lowe calls the production of difference, is actually essential to the capitalist project. That one way that you get out production is to produce difference and to keep workers divided. And he said that actually deserves to be a part of the plot of capital. Um, I'll close the 10 minutes that are on uh, these high-flown matters by telling the story about uh, Herbert Apdecker, the great old Marxist historian who I knew when he was quite old. And he used to tell me this story that uh, he would try to get Du Bois to uh, place himself within the Marxist tradition, to kind of rank himself almost within the Marxist tradition. And uh, Herb was kind of Du Bois' personal assistant at at this time, our, our archivist anyway. And Du Bois would resist and he'd say to Apdecker, uh, at least this is what Apdecker reported, no, I'm a Christian, I'm the pro product of, of uh, Christian education and Christianity, and, and Du Bois was scarcely, mostly a Christian, but he, he didn't want to be judged as a Marxist uh, against other people who devoted their lives to writing about Marxism uh, because he said he came out of a completely different trajectory. I can imagine that he was kind of playing with Apdecker a little bit. <laughs> this may not have been an entirely serious response, but Herb took it as an entirely serious response. So I think I, I, think I see my, myself as kind of in the opposite camp of that is my whole life as a surrealist and as a uh, labor activist, I've been nothing but a Marxist. So I actually, my work I think has to be judged within the Marxist tradition. And if I weren't in that tradition, I wouldn't really know how to proceed. I, I mean, I guess people in that tradition become anti-communist and they have the skills to become anti-communist. But this is Marxist work, and so a part of the book, I'm just gonna try to take a quick shot at what's in the, in the book uh, a little bit. A part of the book develops Lebowitz's ideas uh, about the logic of capital and the production of difference and the management of race. So Elizabeth Esch and I did this book called The Production of Difference, uh, I guess now about four years ago, and um, some of you probably in this room are deciding whether to publish with Verso or an academic press. And you'll make your decisions, you know, and 
to do what you need to do. But I will say that there are things, that book, The Production of Difference, the theory sections of that at Oxford were completely cut out. And so one of the advantages uh, to publishing with a left press is that you can say things that are recognizably important to a left press that are not necessarily recognizably important to history editors at a, at a, a university press. So a couple of the articles in um, this book uh, try to uh, restore some of that theoretical dimension that was chopped from the production of difference, try to talk about the ways in which the, in the United States the history of management and the history of race and one might say the history of policing are all part of the same story. So that dispossession of native lands was justified by the fact that whites were managers. Whites were a managerial race. They could husband the land in a way that native people couldn't husband the land. Clearly the management of slaves by white overseers and the first managerial literature in the United States is produced around the question of how do you manage slaves. So, um, but what we argue also is that this continued right through, and even in industrial capitalism in the United States, the genius of management in the United States was to manage difference. Uh, um, so there are two articles that are about that. Um, a second theme is that uh, the consideration of whiteness as a specific source of demobilization and misery in the working class is a hard-won gain, and the consideration of race and class together within Marxism is a hard-won gain that ought not be easily jettisoned. Not, for example, for the myth that we can somehow unify people if we stop talking so much about race or if we stop talking so much about uh, gender. So there's a very long essay in here that previously was only published in Germany that's about the fact that the critical study of whiteness in the United States was almost entirely a Marxist and socialist uh, project. Going back to the black Marxism of uh, Du Bois, uh, going through James Baldwin, uh, and then uh, with uh, former New Left white scholars doing most of the work uh, in the um, 1980, late 80s and the 1990s and right down to the present. So there's, there's a section of the book that argues about uh, restoring, uh, being proud of the, of the history of Marxist theorizations of race and class and claiming the critical study of whiteness as against the idea that this is postmodernism and this is the linguistic turn and this is every other thing, that it's actually been the product of Marxist uh, scholarship. And finally, and most ineffably, uh, the, a third of the book is kind of early and late, is tries to think about questions of tone as we write about race in the United States now and as we act about race in the United States now. So if I mention the, the essay on solidarity, which closes the book, and it tries to argue that one of the things that bedevils us in social movements is that sometimes we think, we imagine a past in which there were these united social movements and classes were easily united. And in fact, people are oppressed commonly, but they're oppressed commonly in very different ways. And solidarity is very, very difficult and tricky work. Uh, historically, and it still is. And so th that essay tries to provide a little bit of space in which people can begin to, to say, we work towards solidarity, but we don't beat ourselves up specifically every time we fall short. It's, it's a part of the structure that makes it difficult to achieve solidarity. It's not just a part of our personal failings that um, make it difficult to achieve solidarity. And then the introduction kind of tries to emphasize that uh, the tone of too much writing about race and class is extraordinarily dismissive of the position of the so-called other side. And if it were true that there's a simple rhetorical solution to getting race and class right, uh, it might be worth uh, pursuing things in that sort of tone.
but it's just simply not true. And the kind of popularity in some quarters of the left now for the idea that if only we didn't have so much talk about race, gender, and sexuality, people would get down to the real business of talking about uh, class, I think is profoundly uh, wrong, but also profoundly not materialist. We don't, as materialists, believe that wrong ideas persist because they're wrong ideas and people say them a lot. We believe that they have material roots and, and that that's uh, worth exploring. So I'll stop there, thanks. Good evening, how's everyone doing? Let me try again, good evening. Yes, thanks. I'm delighted to join this conversation about David Rodiger's new book, and uh, I want to thank uh, Sophia for organizing the session and congratulate her on the new position at the Asian American Writers Workshop. Um, again, yes. Uh, I'm also thrilled to uh, have this opportunity to be in dialogue with Donna Merge for the first time, and also uh, Christina Heatherton. Um, and to offer a few comments about class, race, and Marxism, as I think it raises really central questions for the current um, conjuncture. I'm delighted to do so for that reason, but also because I've learned so much from David's work over the years and followed his lead in uh, many ways. So let me just uh, jump right to it. Uh, next month marks the 50th anniversary of the Detroit Uprising of 1967. And as many people in this room no doubt, no, that revolt began as city residents witnessed uh, a police harassment of a homecoming party for two black soldiers that had returned from uh, Vietnam. And I, I start with this uh, story because I want to offer some context, I think, for the kind of theoretical tradition that uh, the book uh, situates itself within. Now, the revolt was often described in the press as a mob or a black riot that took place within particular geographical boundaries. Yet, there were, thanks, widely circulated uh, images of the event that showed that it was black and white workers who were engaged in the largest urban uprising in U.S. history. Now, as labor history uh, people in this room know, nine months later, you saw an uprising that took place in May of 1968, as 4,000 workers shut down the uh, Hamtramck uh, assembly plant, which contained the lowest paying jobs in Detroit, and they were disproportionately black workers. These events fired the imagination of organic intellectuals who had come to make up a League of Revolutionary Black Workers, as well as a, a group in Detroit that had a big influence on, and has continued to have an influence on David Rodiger's work that included C.L.R. James, uh, Marty Glaberman, uh, also uh, George Rawick, and sometimes uh, Selma James. And what they argued is that these uh, events were uh, moments of the first importance in the history of black people, but also in the history of the class struggle. Um, and that these uh, events uh, and the wildcat strikes between 67 and 1963 were the some of the most significant shutdowns uh, in American history. Uh, they drew on what W.E.B. Du Bois in his magnum opus, Black Reconstruction, called uh, a general strike of 1863 to 1865, uh, which he had said was decisive uh, turning point in the Civil War, and he claimed it led to one of the most successful interracial working class movements in U.S. history, and was, as he put it, one of the most extraordinary experiments in Marxism that the world before the Russian Revolution, which we also celebrate the 100th anniversary of this year, um, had ever seen. So I start with this story because I think it would be difficult to overstate how much these two moments of working class self-activity, the 1860s and the 1870s, and the 1960s and the 1970s, and the theoretical expression by Du Bois, by James, by Rawick and others, has shaped uh, David Rodiger's work on race and class. As he explains in this book, Class, Race, and Marxism, it's this socialist tradition that he takes up and extends to delineate the ways in which, and I'm quoting him now, race and white supremacy operate as specific modalities in which the logic 
of capital combines rationality and irrationality. So his depiction of this interplay between race and capital, I think, warrants a close study of his arguments, particularly since they speak so powerfully to the current uh, conjuncture. And I want to take his insights about the history of white supremacy and of capitalism seriously uh, in considering how I think he encourages us to think of race as an ideological process that's been critical to winning consent to class rule and that this uh, is far from inexorable or inevitable. Uh, as with his previous books, The Wages of Whiteness Towards the Abolition of Whiteness, Class, race, and Marxism offers an original and generative analysis of the ways in which race has come to be accepted as a natural or inevitable feature of the capitalist landscape. And I think he offers us a historical materialist framework for understanding the ways in which he and our colleague and comrade Betsy Etch, following Lisa Lowe, uh, describe the ways in which the production of difference have enabled capitalism to survive challenges to its hegemony. And he demonstrates how the self-active struggle to overcome racism, capitalism, settler colonialism, and imperialism have, and I'm quoting here, made all workers think more sharp, sharply about new tactics, new possibilities, and new freedoms. And so I think in doing so, it suggests that a struggle over the memory and the meaning of these events, like the wildcat strikes across the color line, the Poor People's Campaign, the Sanitation Workers' Strike in 1968, are critical for the development of an alternative political project and a historical investigation of the history of racism and capitalism. But at the same time, as we debate how to best fight white supremacy and capitalism under Trumpism, class, race, and Marxism helpfully suggest that the most productive theoretical insights don't just emerge in the context of uh, advances in labor and freedom struggles, but also in moments of profound defeat, such as when Antonio Gramsci was writing in a fascist prison in the 1920s and in the 1930s. And I think, you know, he explains this to suggest how the critical study of whiteness emerged in a moment of such bitter defeat, and that was the rise of Reaganism and neoliberalism in the 1980s. And he says, you know, this scholarship was developed in dialogue with African American socialists like Du Bois, like James Baldwin, and others to explain why it is that so many white workers bitterly sided with reaction. In other words, to clarify why so many identified as whites rather than workers engaged in a multiracial class struggle for the benefit of uh, the working class uh, as a whole. So as Rodiger, or David has long emphasized and I think clarifies and elaborates in this book, whatever advantages whiteness may offer in terms of a psychological wage, which he takes from Du Bois, it should be read as a bitter acceptance of crumbs from a racist table and therefore as a tragedy that should be rejected. In doing so, he points to the unfinished business of the project of abolition that Du Bois identified in Black Reconstruction in the radical 1930s in overcoming racism, capitalism, settler colonialism, and imperialism today. So class, race, and Marxism appears in this massive crisis of legitimacy or a crisis of hegemony that's taken shape as he describes it since the massive uh, upsurge of immigrant workers in 2006, the economic downturn of 2007 and 2008, Occupy, uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, Standing Rock, and now with the rise of Trump. And as we know, crises are moments of rupture. The resolutions are not determined in advance. You know, one of the things that I took from uh, reading this book is that while cynical appeals to white supremacy, to nationalism, and to populism have often been deployed to justify ruling class resolutions of crises, that these projects are far from inevitable or inexorable. After all, as the rebellions from Ferguson to Standing Rock clarify, 
anti-racist and anti-imperialist struggles have been at the cutting edge of class struggles uh, in the United States and therefore uh, you know, of the renewal of a socialist project. They demonstrate, I think, the strategic and practical necessity of rejecting neoliberal multiculturalism, which David makes uh, some uh, contributions uh, towards our understanding, and embracing struggles to abolish white supremacy and redistribute social wealth. And in doing so, they challenge us to, as class race and Marxism suggest, engage in historical materialist analyses of the relationships between race and class, settler colonialism, social reproduction, and capitalist political economy that had been pushed outside of the boundaries of tolerable discourse, you know, at least since the early uh, Cold War. In reclaiming this critical Marxist project of analyzing race and class, I think that David's absolutely right. We need uh, a debate, we need a comradely uh, tone, and, but we also need to rebuild the anti-racist uh, left. And in this way, among others, the book could not be uh, more timely or welcome. So thank you very much for it, and I look forward to our discussion. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'd also like to start by thanking Sophia for all of her wonderful work, both in organizing this event and really, um, as long as I've known her, for just doing an amazing job putting together events, doing outreach, knitting together circles, uh, uh, different communities of journalists and writers and activists, and just what a pleasure it has been to work with her. Um, I uh, came to this panel uh, quite recently, and I was so honored to get the, an opportunity to talk about David Roediger's new collection of essays and just more generally about the scope of his work, which had a huge influence on me. I just came from an organizing meeting in Chicago that was a four-day meeting, and it was bringing together all the different, many, many different segments for movements for black lives, almost all black female organizers coming from all over the country. So people coming from Song, from BYP 100, uh, from Blackbird, from numerous organizations throughout the country, from Project South. And it was kind of an attempt to think about how these different tendencies fit together. And being there, I was, spending a lot of time talking about the historical moment that we're in. And I think that these essays are incredibly important in knitting together how we bring together analysis of class, race, and Marxism. Uh, one of the things that I'm quite struck, for, struck about is just an intergenerational dialogue against, about Marxism. That when you're talking about young organizers, many of them are in their early 30s. They are coming of age post-Cold War. And I spent a lot of time thinking about what it means to analyze this particular moment as post-Cold War. Because I'm born um, just at the cusp, you know, at the tail end of the 60s social movements, but very much came of age in the 1980s uh, through that kind of, you know, Marxist leftist socialist formation in which the Cold War was so important, both the scale of anti-communism and as we became politicized, the embrace of Marxism. So I think that David Roediger's work for me fit into a larger kind of historical moment that to me, Marxism was absolutely crucial. For younger radical organizers, there has not been the same transmission of Marxist ideas. And so I thought one thing we might talk about is how to have intergenerational dialogue about Marxism. And I think this book does important work in talking about, for example, in the final chapter, the politics of solidarity, how we talk about solidarity, how we look at it historically, its use um, in the labor movement in the 19th century, and then what some of the challenges are for using it for contemporary organizing. Um, David Roediger's work has always deeply resonated with me because I too grew up in a white working class community in Western Pennsylvania. And when I read Wages of Whiteness, it gave me a way to try to integrate what it meant to grow up in what today we would call a zone of abandonment, you know, living in an area that had been utterly divested of jobs with terrible environmental devastation that was overwhelmingly white with a tiny black population that were chain migrants from Laurel, Mississippi. Um, at the same time, witnessing profound violence against our family and the, uh, having, being able to understand both of those simultaneously, knowing what it's like to grow up in a working class community, in a white working class community, to see what people are facing. But at the same time, during the Reagan era, to see that so much of the 
political attention was the fear of the contact with black families, the desegregation of neighborhoods, the contact in public and private schools, and the idea that the welfare state was going to benefit people other than themselves. So wages of whiteness actually, for me, played a really foundational role that allowed me to understand the links between uh, third world Marxism and thinking about the traditions of CLR James, Walter Rodney, um, the Grenadian Revolution, you know, the importance of those north-south revolutions, um, particularly in the Caribbean, as a formation. And I think for many people my age, that was a reference point, as was state socialism. So our grounding in American Marxism was often linked to Grenada, it was linked to Cuba, it was linked to Walter Rodney, and this was a kind of seamless understanding both about struggles inside the United States and how to think about state socialism, especially as it affected the global south. So I found his work to be really profoundly important as a new way to talk about race and to integrate it into Marxism. I think that one of the challenges that we're facing is that Marxism is not being taught in the university, and many of the institutions that we've used to transmit Marxism don't exist in the same way. So when we were at the MBL convening, I was talking to them about party structure, and people asked me very basic things. What is party structure? So core Marxist ideas are things that um, have not been I have not been taught in the university, and I, I'm curious about how we talk about the effects of the Cold War and anti-communism, um, and how that has impeded transmission to a subsequent generation. And it seems that Verso is an important place to do this. The intellectual history that's in these collections of essays I see is a very important tool for education and opening up these dialogues, but I think they need to be opened up. I mean, even to be able to define oneself as a Marxist requires exposure to Marxist ideas, it requires pedagogy and epistemic community, and I find that this epistemic community is not nearly as strong uh, today as it was when I was the age of many of the protesters. So I'm curious to talk about that and to talk about how we translate these ideas. Jacobin has done an important job, I think, in the dissemination of left ideas, but um, as uh, David states, so eloquently, there's also been a real tension about this separation between race and class, and that's taken place in a variety of venues. So he argues, what is distressingly new, or at least resurgent, is the extent to which indictments of anti-racism and even the use of race as a concept come now from liberalism and the left. Electorally, of course, one hallmark of the Democratic Leadership Council to move the Democratic party still further to the right has been an attempt to distance itself from specific appeals to and identification with people of color. Thus, constituencies most aware of both race and class inequities are marginalized in the name of the appeal for universal programs, even as universal programs such as welfare as we know it are subjected to bipartisan and anything but colorblind attacks. So on the one hand, you have a kind of liberal attack on the use of anti-racism, but we're also seeing a resurgence in a kind of socialist discourse that sees race as antithetical to studying the real operations of capital. And the essays in this book, I think, do a beautiful job explaining to us about why race and class need to be fully integrated and understanding the very history of whiteness as growing out of Marxism and genealogies of the left. So I can't think of a more important moment for the work of David Rodiger at the height of white nationalism. Um, for me, I feel that it is a return in many ways to a politics of the 1970s and 1980s. I'm from Erie County, which was one of the most important counties for the victory of Trump. And a deep, deep left materialist engagement with white nationalism that understands the profundity of how class and sense of both dispossession and entitlement inform whiteness. And I think that that to me has always been one of the most deeply resonant parts of David Rodiger's work. Um, the politics of solidarity is something that this book engages with and it's really the point at which it, uh, it ends. And I'm hoping that we can have a, a discussion about that, how we think about solidarity and how complicated solidarity has become as the core platforms and constituencies of the left in the United States have shifted. I mean, one of the most profound shifts I've seen over the last five years has, has been really the shift in gender. When you go to these organizing spaces, they are 95% female. 
They really are. This is true of the housing movement. It's true of jobs for justice, the left of the labor movement. You know, the core materialist struggles have really shifted towards women. And queer, it's not even a politics of queer solidarity. Lesbians and transgender people are the core organizers. So in that sense, this is really a, a politics that is just absolutely integral and can't be separated. So um, I uh, am honored to participate in this and curious to have a dialogue about how to fit these ideas into some of the political challenges that we're facing today. Okay, good evening. Okay, I hope you are all doing well because you all look very hot and miserable to me. Uh, so I'm gonna try to keep my comments short. Um, I also wanna thank Sophia Hussein, who is impressively, Im impressively sober on her last day of work. Congratulations. Um, I just wanna, um, you know, Sophia's been a delight to work with. She's also been a tireless champion of the work of the anti-racist left. She's actively cultivated relationships between radical theory and social movements, and it's fitting that uh, her last event is on David Rodiger's incredible new book, uh, Class, Race, and Marxism. The uh, Asian American Writers Workshop is extremely lucky to have you. Uh, thank you so much, Sophia. Okay, yes. Um, so, uh, Sophia asked me not to read, so for her sake, I'd like you all to pretend that I'm not reading. But, I mean, look, I didn't know this was gonna be live streamed, so I'm gonna read. Um, I, I'm uh, also very honored and excited to be here to celebrate Dave Rodiger's new work. David is an endlessly generous scholar, one who has consistently made principled interventions in dialogue with social movements. The new collection is important for debates about Marxism, both within and around the anti-racist left. In such debates, as my mentor, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, uh, consistently reminds me, the point is not just to be right. The point is to get free. I think this is the spirit with which David writes, reflects, and revises his thinking. This is the spirit of this new volume, and I'm excited to be here in the spirit of generosity and towards liberation. David opens the book with a question of legibility. How do we understand the class struggle at present, especially when so many people are being politicized by issues of racism, police killings, Muslim travel bans, racist anti-immigration bills and proposed walls, mass incarceration, drone warfare, the killings of trans people of color, and militarized settler colonial violence, particularly in the repression of the water protectors opposing the Dakota Access Pipeline, and now in these insipid celebrations of uh, Canada's birthday. Um, this was also a question that motivated Policing the Planet, the book that Jordan and I co-edited. By understanding anti-racist struggles against policing, against urban redevelopment, against immigration control and militarism, we believed that we could more robustly chart challenges to racial capitalism at present, and I think David's book moves with a similar intent and spirit. David, as he mentioned, begins the book with a specific critique of David Harvey and uh, Harvey's insistence that the struggles that have emerged out of Ferguson and in response to Black Lives Matter are not recognizable as anti-capitalist struggles. I need to say that David Harvey is someone I've worked with and who I have a lot of affection for. I particularly admire the ways in which he asks us to think hard about our commonplace assumptions of how capitalism works. At his best, I think he is invested in how those imaginaries can either authorize or deauthorize uh, different terrains of struggle. But I think Dave Rudiger is right to critique David Harvey. By not recognizing the class character of these anti-racist struggles because they do not formally identify themselves in the language of anti-capitalism, David Harvey profoundly misses the mark. In his, open, in his opening, David uh, Rodiger correctly presents um, the challenge facing us on the left. Do we choose to defensively gatekeep and maintain formalist distinctions of how we imagine that capital ought to work? Or do we expand our theories in order to identify how the class struggle is actually unfolding before us? David Harvey's caution is re related to a regrettable but common narrative that, quote, identity politics is to, is to blame for the decline of class-based politics. I wanna say that this is particularly odd that at this moment in history, both the left and leading voices of the far right are equally invested in critiquing identity politics, using this catch-all term to name what they see as a singular source of division and divisiveness obstructing their respective movements. 
The poisonous shorthand of identity politics deployed by both the left and the right subsumes, to my mind, the insurgent and radical critiques of capitalism by anti-racist, feminist, queer, and non-normative lenses. These critiques have advanced rather than inhibited Marxist theory, a point that David maintains throughout this book. Easy dismissals of identity politics have made many social movements perceive Marxism as inhospitable to their struggles. And liberals are all too happy to cultivate and nurture this discomfort. As we build the left and as we defend ourselves, we have to be very cognizant of the arguments and the tone that David Rodiger is putting before us. One thing that David reminds us throughout the book is that class is a relation, not a fixed identity. The dynamics of class movements emerge in different convergences of struggle, and our theories have to be capacious enough to account for these convergences. And to offer just one concrete example that's been on my mind, and I'm sure on a lot of your minds, I've been very heartened by both the outrage and the organizing that have emerged out of the scandal of the Grenfell Towers in London, it's, I, I'm, which I'm not going to totally reproduce. I'm, I'm hoping most people know about this. Um, where, of course, an untold number of people who were poor, immigrant, working class, died when the public housing tower block where they lived caught fire. The fire, we know, was accelerated by non-fire retardant panels, which were installed on the face of the building in order to make it less unsightly for the wealthier neighboring residents for whom it was an eyesore. So while we might not yet have a total synthesis of Marxist theory that fully accounts for the convergences of working class exploitation, finance capital, the predations of real estate speculation, immigration, colonialism, racism, social production, queer familial relations, and neoliberal austerity, this is essentially what residents who are organizing with each other against this mass murder by the state and capital are currently articulating. Our theorizing should follow such movements rather than the other way around. To get free, we have to be able to comprehend the changing terrain of class relations as it unfolds before us. This is a point I think David returns to throughout the collection. There are several things, there are many, many things I appreciate about this volume that if it weren't so hot, maybe I'd tell you all of them. <laughs> Let me just name a few. The book, as has been mentioned, offers a, a beautiful genealogy of David's own thinking. Through his essays, we come to understand the close working relationships between people like George Rawick, Marty Glaberman, and C.L.R. James. We come to see how the radical knowledge is necessarily produced in context of struggle. We learn, for example, that Alexander Saxon would never have encountered the work of W.E.B. Du Bois despite being born in the same hometown and going to the same college, were it not for the radical left that introduced him to it, in this case, the Communist Party, who kept Du Bois's work and radical vision alive. We also learn, importantly, that people can disagree. David notes that a, quote, common commitment to Marxism does not imply agreement in particulars. Instead, in reproducing debates with his friends, his mentors, and his critics, David shows us how we can respectfully disagree, how we can advance our positions by taking each other seriously without rancor, how we can move in common cause, in other words, how we can be comrades. This rich collection which spans many years of David's thinking also helps contextualize different interventions that have emerged in response to different political struggles. We come to understand questions that have emerged from the new left, uh, from the revolutionary milieu in Detroit that Jordan talked about, the, from the reactionary politics of Reaganism, the struggles against apartheid in South Africa, et cetera. In reflecting upon past writings, David exercises remarkable humility a willingness to say when he was wrong, when other scholars made points better than he did, when alternative genealogies could have been better represented, etc. But he's also careful to show that sometimes interventions made in one specific place and time shifted meaning when they were transposed too easily into different spaces and times. He speaks, for example, of coming to understand the debates that he was particularly invested in among class-first labor historians and activists were distinct from the, oh, thank you very much. You still with me? Distinct from the context that Paul Gilroy was responding to and against race, that is the narrow nationalism of the fascist right and some elements of the left that he was encountering in England. In this book, David is able to show us how context matters, how we have to be precise about our interventions that, uh, that are responsive to particular times, places, and conditions, and that we ought not generalize uh, specific interventions too quickly. Um, in this regard, I just want to close with, well, I wrote a few questions, but let me just ask the one that's really on my mind. Um, as we speak 
My, so as, as Sophia mentioned, I'm about to start a job at Barnard College, but for the next month, I'm still officially a professor at Trinity College. And at this moment, my colleague and comrade, Johnny Eric Williams, a respected senior scholar of race, racism, and sociology, is being persecuted and maligned by far-right trolls, which includes the President of the United States. As has often been the case, Johnny's words have been twisted and taken out of context to make it seem as though his anti-racist provocations about destroying white supremacy were injunctions to kill white people. David's book deals with the selective misinterpretations of both liberals and some elements of the left. So my question is, in this moment of malicious right-wing attack, especially against anti-racists, especially against those on the left, like Kianga Yamada Taylor, like Johnny Eric Williams, uh, how can those on the anti-racist left organize, build strength, build power, when we, both who we actually are and who we are imagined to be, are under coordinated and violent attack? I'd love to hear David's thoughts as well as the thoughts of everybody in this room because we have to figure this out together. Thank you. Looks like David's writing. So we're gonna transition now to a discussion. Everyone has a kind of question they wanna focus on, and we're gonna do this for the next uh, 30 minutes. Also, if you wanna, if you're really hot and thirsty, there's water over here. Um, I know it might not be the easiest to get to, but it's really hot, so don't worry about like ruining the camera or walking around to get over there for water. Yeah, this question that Christina posed, and I think what we're going to do is uh, each of the panelists is going to ask one question, and then we'll, we're aware of how hot and I don't think miserable is the right word, but uh, <laughs> uh, so it, we'll do that for a little while, and then we will get to the the questions and and uh, brief statements from the from the floor. Um, but this, this question, I think, is a, is a vitally important question. I was at a thing, a showing of the new film about Ferguson, Whose Streets, which has really, in, have you seen it yet? Yeah, it has really interesting Asada footage in it around uh, Brittany Farrell. But um, I saw it in, in Kansas, and Jamala Rogers, a leader of uh, Organization of Black Struggle in St. Louis, came up with the film and was talking about it. And somebody asked a question very like your question, somebody from the community asked this, this question, and it kind of, one way we've begun to try to think about this is that if we could settle on the word ally or if we could settle on the word accomplice, we'd somehow have solved this, this problem, and so the, the question was, was about that, but I really like Jamala's response as a starting point. She, she said that, um, that she thought that, that uh, it was strange that white people were asked to be allies, that uh, white America has created white supremacy and f forwarded whiteness. And so uh, the problem is a, a problem for whites to tackle, and they should be asking people of color to be allies in their own struggle against whiteness. And I thought it was suggestive of how far words can help us and how far they can't, because I think that there's still a necessity uh, for leadership of people of color in, in anti-racist movements. So this idea that's a, a bastardization of how SNCC supposedly uh, acted with regard to black power and, and white radicals uh, in the 1960s, uh, the idea that there could be a white movement that would tackle white supremacy without learning from people of color is, I think, completely wrong. Uh, Ann Braden, one of the last things she said to me before, before she died was, she, she said, I'm 80, whatever she was, however old she was, uh, and I'm just too damn old to be in all white movements anymore. I'll never be in another meeting that's all white people. So on the one hand, we're wanting to develop this practice that says, Morally, as Baldwin would put it, white people have an obligation 
to dismantle this system. And on the other hand, we have to have this practical recognition that they need help in order to do it. And so I think it's a very difficult kind of practical problem that, that, that we face. But I like Jamala's summary as a starting point for how we think about it. And I don't want to just respond without others responding also to Christina's question. Yeah. Um, so I had a question which is kind of historical question, which is thinking about also this post-Cold War moment. And I mention it because I think when I was a young organizer and kind of coming of age politically, Marxism, for people that consider themselves really, the word progressive wasn't used, radicals. Marxism was a core part of one's formation. So a lot of the debates and anger, and sometimes even, I don't want to call it anti-Marxist discourse, but it came precisely because of an engagement because people saw themselves as part of a shared tradition. And even in terms of core curriculum, you know, Marxism was being taught in socio sociological theory. It was a core part of liberal arts education. So one thing I'm just curious about is, you know, one of the issues for young organizers is for how to think about how to integrate race, class, gender, and most importantly, deeply materialism, you know, historical materialism. Um, this question about popular education to me feels very, very important. Yeah. So sometimes I think some of the uh, um, discomfort with this form of analysis comes from a lack of popular and political education. And I was just curious about how you think about your work in the context of, is that a useful framework, Cold War and post-Cold War? Do you think of it in that way? And, um, and what do you think are some of the challenges for uh, how, to, how to disseminate these ideas? But I think it, this idea of post-Cold War and, and, and Cold War is fruitful, but I think it also could be troubled and have some contradictions in it. One is that when I was a student, a college student in the 60, late 60s and, and early 70s, uh, you know, there were a fair number of professors who didn't claim Marxism allowed because of the Cold War and because of still McCarthyite uh, repression, the little school in Northern Illinois where I went to school, uh, we were set to hire E.P. Thompson. E.P. Thompson wanted to come teach there when I was an undergraduate and uh, the college fathers in reaction to his Marxism uh, figured out that he didn't have a PhD. So this little, what had been a teacher's college five years before was too good for E.P. Thompson to, to, uh, to teach there. So I think that we also gained something over the kind of height of the Cold War period when so many people were either silent about their Marxism and trying to figure out how to use terms from modernization theory or something to cover their tracks so that, so that students couldn't really learn Marxism from those professors, even if they were in some sense uh, Marxists. So I, I think we gain that. I think we also gain that the young people that I see don't have the anti-communist uh, programming that goes into this. I mean, they have sometimes a knowledge of state socialism that troubles uh, them about, uh, about Marxism. But I think that we, are, so we're also in a kind of a promising moment. And I, I think that your emphasis on popular education is really vital because I don't, I don't know anybody as a comrade who learned their Marxism at university. I mean, they might have gotten interested through a class, but I think that at least in my generation, you learned Marxism in the movement and you learned it in your on your own time and in popular classes and you know probably 50 of you were in capital study groups at one point or another but a lot of other kinds of, of uh, popular education like that and some of that continues and one of the wonderful things that David Harvey does is to teach people the basics of Marxism in, in uh, certain palatable uh, ways but I think you're right that this is a vital task. Yeah. But I, I, what I meant was, uh, if anybody has a response to anybody else's question, so if either of you want to talk about Donna's question. Um. I, I may come back to it. I, I okay, have to kind of sit with it for a second. I just had in my sure. head, I'm sure people can identify the question that I was going to pose. But um, I mean, one of the things that I guess, uh, you know, Christina mentioned in her comments and I wanted to come back to is that the book engages in some self-criticism. You kind of talk about not only you know, things that you have rethought, but things that the critical study of whiteness have rethought, right? Yeah. And so one of them that 
I thought people might be interested in, and I'd love to hear more about was, you say historical materialists or the anti-racist left ought to rethink this notion of privilege. Um, and maybe to let it go in the context of declining conditions for working people and rethink uh, advantage. So I wonder if you could say a little bit more about what yeah. brought you to that and I what's mean, at stake. So the, this grows out of, I was on the radio in Rochester, on National Public Radio in Rochester, New York, and Rochester is, I think, the fifth poorest big city now, kind of thoroughly gutted by deindustrialization. Um, so that I did a tour with labor people of the town, and then I was uh, on the radio, and the, the guy on the radio was marvelous, but for an hour, he probably used the term white privilege 35 times, and I thought, you know, the neighborhoods that I've just driven through, you could organize in those neighborhoods. You couldn't organize around white privilege as one of the leading things that you started by talking about. Now, I raise this in the book very trepidatiously, partly because it's silly. We don't get to decide whether to use white privilege or white advantage. But there is a sense, I think, that if we had a choice, that in certain instances we might be better off using the term white advantage than white privilege. Because it, sometimes it begins to sound like not being brutalized by cops is a privilege instead of a human right. And so that for some parts of the uh, white population, the so-called white population in the United States, um, I think they could acknowledge their own advantages, which are many, and they can name. I used to teach in a UAW New Directions, Jerry Tucker's summer school, uh, and I would go in and, and talk about white workers, and I'd say, and maybe it was 40% workers of color, 60% white, and I'd say, so why, white worker, why would workers want to think they're white? What makes workers think they're white? And it was no mystery. The people were able to say, oh, you can get a loan. <laughs> oh, you can live anywhere. Your kids can go to, to good schools. You can get in the skilled trades. This was in the 1970s in, in auto. So that, you know, those advantages are real and known on some level by white working people. But those same people might not necessarily want to think of themselves as being privileged in this social order. Now, again, this is not a campaign of mine to, to, to change this. And white privilege has done, as a concept, very, very important work in Black Lives Matter. And young people know it and use it and use it to good uh, advantage. And so it's not a soapbox that I'm getting on about this. But there are moments when I, wa I find myself wanting to say, uh, let's talk about white advantage in the United States instead of white privilege in the United States. Yeah. Well, I, I'm thinking about uh, Donna's question about popular education. And I'm also, I know somebody in this room can help me with this. I'm also thinking of, was it the Stranglers album that reproduced three chords on uh, their liner notes that said, this is how you play these three chords, now go start a punk band? Someone here knows. OK. I, I want, who? Was it the Ramones? <laughs> All right. <laughs> right wing. <laughs> All right, so I hope everybody heard that. So. Uh, you know, I, uh, the last chapter in this book is um, of uh, a version of uh, the speech that David gave as uh, his inaugural address as the president of the American Studies Association. I might be getting this wrong, but I think that same year was the first year of the Marxist caucus in the ASA. I was a part of that caucus. The plan was that we were all going to get into a room and we were going to strategize after a quick round of introductions. The problem was that the room was totally stuffed, not unlike this one, but with better air conditioning. Uh, and so we barely even got through the introductions, which, you know, the, I know, I, I'm, I'm hot, but I like the jacket, so. Uh, uh, I'm okay, I'm okay, thank you though. Uh, 
so, you know, in that round of introductions, the question was just, who are you and what brought you to the table? And, uh, you know, I'm sure we'd have an interesting discussion doing a similar round of introductions. I'm not asking for that, though. Uh, and what people talked about was this beautiful array of really smart questions of how people were thinking about historical materialism, how they were thinking about Marxism, you know, social reproduction and porn, settler colonialism and the political economy of extractive economies, policing, municipal financing, and racism. Like really wonderful, generative, new syntheses. And so, you know, we didn't get to the planning, but it was a wonderful room to be a part of. And so, I guess the only thing I want to trouble is that we, you know, that the point is that we need to educate people, that the direction has to be we authorize something. Instead, I really think that the book David's produced is an invitation, not unlike that Ramones album. I, I think what we should actually be doing is encouraging more creative and imaginative work. You all came here tonight because you're thinking about these questions. What are the movements that you're a part of? What are the movements that have touched you? How are you struggling through this? Why don't you write something? You know, where's the new music? Where's the poetry? Where are the new books? I mean, I, I do think, and I've experienced this, you know, the, the enormous pressure that comes with thinking about Marxist theory as this very fragile thing that only a few men are entitled to write about. When in practice, you know, like my experience is much more like this room and like that ASA caucus. I think there's really interesting creative work and I, I do think that part of the answer to your question, Donna, is how do we open that? How do we get people to think about Marxism like that Ramones album and go start their own punk band or some equivalent metaphor? One reason I think that's so important is that we pay a big price that so much of the people who define the, the left in the United States are in academia. Because ac anti-racist education and action requires repetition. And almost all of academic work requires creation and a new idea. You have an idea for a minute, you move on to another idea, you move on to a, another idea. And that's not how we win people when there's a reproduction of white supremacy all the time. So the, the same things which are actually sometimes kind of commonplace and a little bit boring to repeat have to be repeated over and over and across generations and in new places and as people come into to struggles. It's not enough to have good ideas and to have a, a new idea. You have to be able to win people to old ideas uh, as well. And I think academia very much cuts against that in certain, certain ways. I just want to say one thing about this. Um, can people hear me? Yeah. Um, you know, Donna, you say, uh, you know, one of the challenges is that Marxism is not taught in the university. I mean, I, I never read Capital in, in a single class I took. Or did, nor did I read Black Reconstruction or, or Black Jacobins and so on. I mean, you really have to engage in these study groups and uh, organizations and so on. But I mean, I think partly it's because of you know some of the work um, that David engages in the books helps us understand why that deeply anti-Marxist project takes hold. So Jody Malamed, for example, and Rod Ferguson, who you talk about in the book, but also in, in other work, Seizing Freedom, What's the name of the review did it in AQ? Uh, Freedom Break. Freedom Break, sorry. Um, and, you know, they show that neoliberal multiculturalism is a strategy of incorporation, I think, precisely as a counterinsurgent strategy to prevent Marxism from emerging, to precisely to demonize and criminalize a materialist kind of anti racist radicalism. Um, and it's a problem I think we ought to. Uh, continue to wrestle with, and some of the most exciting uh, work that David's also engaging with is challenging the kind of recognition politics at the heart of neoliberal multiculturalism and reclaiming Marx to think through the problem of capitalist accumulation and settler colonialism. So, uh, you know, uh, in Canadian context, we have people like Glenn Coltard, who I think is doing uh, important work, and then transnational work by people like uh, Audra Simpson, who I, I think is in the, in the room. So I think that you know, this uh, is a kind of contradictory moment. On one hand, we've seen uh, an com almost complete locking out of the Marxist uh, tradition. But then there's a lot of pushing back uh, 
uh, that's happening, and it has to do with the kind of things uh, that Christina and Dave were emphasizing about the kind of queer, anti-racist, indigenous, uh, you know, embrace of the Marxist tradition and intervening in the present, and that seems really exciting uh, to me. Can everyone hear me? Okay, there we go. I just wanted to make a quick response. Um, I agree with um, everything everyone said. I guess I didn't mean to imply that the university should Promethean offer Marxist ideas. That, that's really not what I meant. But given that I study the Panthers and that the community colleges, the what took place in the 1960s, the profound access to public education, how important those study groups were, and the kind of appropriation, things that today people call the undercommons, that appropriation and the use of study groups. But I absolutely agree, DIY, consciousness raising groups, study groups, but simply raising that idea. Because I do think, not so much in the elite universities, but you know, there was a radical moment in the 1960s where campuses that didn't charge tuition were sites of major organizing, and then some of those people left. So it's not too, to argue that the university is the exclusive site. But I just, I mention that because I think we live in a time precisely when that moment has been erased. It's, a, it's, a, it's something to tell people. My students are always surprised by it, about the radical university, precisely because students are shut out. The immense loads of debt that people carry, the, you know, the meaning of the university as a kind of you know, vocational education to get a job now is it's, the meaning of the university has changed. But I just think it's worth having a dialogue about that. How do we do it? Because it also, that's what goes back to also what I was talking about, the party model. And really this comes from talking to some of the organizers who are involved in the movement for black lives, in which you know, there is a definition right now of a leaderful, mov mo a leaderful movement. And in many ways it defines itself against the vanguardist party. So while things like Asada Shakur and the Panthers are very important in terms of the iconography and inspiration of the movement, how people understand organization is very different. So I think that the dialogue between the, you know, the important corpus of work that David Rodeker has done about how to understand whiteness and white nationalism, I remain interested in kind of, you know, how we engage ideas of historical materialism. And you know, I kind of feel like I come from a different generation. And it may be that these are much more broadly disseminated than I see. But from going to organizing meetings, there is a very clear interge intergenerational divide in the black left between people that were members of the Committee for Correspondence, those of us that are talking about the Grenadian Revolution and the Cuban Revolution while acknowledging its problems, and then a younger generation that tends to see that as um, quite different. So that's really what I was speaking to, not to a kind of you know, Promethean model. But I think we have to talk about it. Newspaper, you know, print newspapers have taken on a different meaning. It's been wonderful to watch people use the internet and the development of all kinds of left press, which I think has been a, a real remarkable development over the last decade. <laughs> I think it's really important what you're saying about thinking about the university as a site of struggle and uh, you know, drawing on these traditions of the Panthers and so on and seeing the campus as a place to organize. And this is incredibly important in the context where there's this kind of popular uh, dismissive you know, social media circulation that says you know, what we do on campuses doesn't really uh, matter at all. Um, and I, I think, you know, it goes along, and I want to bring it back to the urgency of what Christina concluded with in the context of the right-wing attack. They understand the university as a site of struggle. They're trying to, you know, build up all the momentum they can uh, to shut us down through the, you know, attacks on uh, Kianga Yamada-Taylor, Johnny Williams, you know, uh, uh, Geo and others, right? I mean, this is something that we really have to take seriously, and it's not unrelated to the erasure of that memory of radicalism, you know, that goes back to the 60s and, and beyond, right? So I, I really appreciate you bringing that to the table. All right, I think we're gonna transition to Q&A now. Um, I think the best way to do this is maybe just people raise their hand if they have a question, we'll take three at a time, and then I think we'll try to wrap up a little bit early so we can like mingle amongst each other and talk. Um, okay. Um, okay, great. Let's do that. I'm going to start with you. Hi. Uh, thank you to all the speakers um, for the great talk. So, um, 
Oh, right. Sorry. Uh, my name is Helios. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. Um, so, well, my, my question has to do with one of the things that, um, David, you said, um, the production of difference as central to the working of capital. Like, I, I thought that was a very interesting um, notion. And um, so, I mean, on one hand, it does, it sounds like you're talking about an ideological move, right? Like something like, a, like, like whiteness as a psychological refuge. On the other hand, it also seems like you're talking about like a concrete economic process, like something that capitalism actually needs. Um, so I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit more. Um, and I also wanted to, to ask like, so, so what we see in the far right movements today is like this tendency to displace the antagonisms of capital by projecting them onto the figure of the other. Um, and I wonder how you think like this sort of production of difference maps onto that. Because on one hand, like, you know, there are obvious similarities, but then on the other hand, it also does seem like, so I, I take whiteness to be in like contrast to blackness, let's say. Um, so in the case of blackness, it seems like the, the other is a lot closer than, than, it, than it is in the case of like the immigrants or the Muslims, right? And there is this historical um, um, set of like circumstances wherein they've been oppressed, et cetera. Um, so I wonder if you could speak to that as well. And my last thing, very brief, I swear, but it's just about like um, the, 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 this conversation about identity politics. Um, I, I mean, short of a couple of class re pure class reductionists, I don't think anyone really wants to dismiss identity from the picture altogether. But I think the real danger here is identitarianism, wherein identity becomes like the central focus of your politics. And that, of course, like, you know, leads to things like uh, Beyonce being heralded as like the, the, the queen, of, uh, like a feminist icon or something like that. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, no, but, and, and well, I think, Earlier you spoke about, um, uh, someone alluded to the fact that like, you know, th these are measures to undermine the tradition of radical critique. And I think this is, there, so there were um, documents that were recently declassified under the Freedom of Information Act that showed that the CIA, act, or, the, or perhaps it was the FBI, act, actively like uh, propagated postmodern theory to undermine the, the tradition of radical critique. So I, I think there perhaps is some overlap there, but yeah, thank you. So we're gonna try and do the three questions so they can kind of answer them all together. So let's make it a little bit more brief. Thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Jordan Helene, uh, he and him. I have a question, I forget whose opening comments mention it, but it mentions something along the lines of uh, sort of a mainstream liberal politics that's sort of shying away from looking at issues of race um, in order to sort of emphasize a sort of um, universal programs, universal welfare programs. And this is a sort of a thing that's been like, I've kind of been struggling with it for a while because I, I see this whole sort of divide between, I guess, sort of what was mentioned just before, you know, identity politics or class politics. And for a long time, I've really considered these sorts of universal programs, universal health care, universal education, universal basic income as being unquestionably worthy goals. But now I, I'm starting to see that there is a serious critique of them. And I kind of wonder what is the future of, a, of, of working towards these goals? Can they be, can this be done? Should it be done? What do you think of that? All right. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, um, my, my main question is that I'd like to start to say this is a very confusing time. Um, there's definitely a lot on everybody's mind, it seems. Uh, there's a lot to hope for, at least on the left. Um, I think with this conversation of like the post Cold War era, there's a lot more young people and there's a lot more people in general that are openly coming out and saying that yes, I am a socialist, yes, I am a Marxist, yes, I am a communist, an anarchist, a syndicalist. But at the same time, there doesn't seem to be like that organization that could unite the left and that could unite for class politics. But my question is more towards the future. Like, what are your views on the future scenarios where, say, in like 40 and 50 years, it's already projected that like white people won't have, there won't be like the same ideas of race that we have today, hopefully. There won't be like these, like the idea of white supremacy may not even be a factor considering that in 40 or 50 years, white people won't be the majority population. And also, like with the material circumstance, like are we approaching a point in capitalism where the next crisis could, 
put everybody's material well-being at stake and everybody in humanity will suffer because of it. And so do you have any hope that any unity will be possible based off of these two ideas, the uh, inevitable destruction of white supremacy and the inevitable worsening material situation under capitalism and neoliberalism? Okay. Um, okay. Um, um, yeah. The, the the first question about the materiality and the ideology of the production of difference. Uh, we closed the production of difference at a time when I was living at um, University of Illinois, and there was a, a packing town uh, called Beardstown. Uh, just down the road. It, it's a town that was uh, a sundown town, so an all-white town, very good union jobs, limited to, uh, to white folks. Uh, and then when, they, um, when uh, Oscar Mayer threatened to move the plant out, the union uh, accepted that they would literally m kill uh, a time and a half the uh, animals that were being killed. So it was no new technology, nothing else, just direct speed up. And meatpacking is already the most occupationally dangerous, injury-prone uh, injury occupation in the United States. So this plant literally faced, how do you get people to do this? And the union also exceeded to uh, give backs that made it a, a not such a good working class job in terms of wages anymore. And so all of a sudden the new Cargill Cargill Meat Solutions was the new name of the, of the plant. Uh, when they came in, they, they said, how do you do this? You bring the workers of the world to this sundown town. So that all of a sudden there were 25 languages in the, in the schools, and this happens in Kansas, this happens in Iowa uh, all the time. And uh, partly the white workers retired early or figured out a way to get disability and had disability from carpal tunnel uh, given this new regime of, of production. And so they very quickly filled this plant with people from just all over the world, but also in all different immigration statuses and situations. So they had workers who were undocumented, they had workers who were immigration lottery winners, they had workers who were refugees, they had everybody except African American unemployed people from Chicago they brought down to, to f fill these jobs in this plant and they just pitted them against each other. And they would, so somebody w would win the immigration lottery in the Congo, a little bit later would be a worker in Beardstown, Illinois, and if they were not meeting production, Cargill had salmon cannery ships, packing ships in Alaska, and they'd send them to Alaska as punishment for not panning out in, in Beardstown. So I think, what we're trying to argue is that there is this ideology of whiteness that, that matters, but there's also a way in which pitting workers against each other has been a central way to get production out in the, in the United States and to accumulate uh, capital. Um, yeah, the healthcare and universalism one, I think it's, a, it, you're right that it's a time, Angela Davis was out visiting not too long ago and I, I said, that, well, too long ago, things have changed since then, but two months ago, and I said, well, surely nobody will be in the position of defending Obamacare now, right? And, uh, you know, we had a kind of an argument <laughs> about that. But I, I think that part of the supposition in the United States is that we don't get to have a welfare state because uh, a segment of the white population regards welfare as uh, a racialized program. And it doesn't matter if the welfare is, uh, so-called welfare, is um, universal or not. Aid to Families with Dependent Children is a universal program. It's not a program for African American people, and yet when Clinton ended welfare as we know it, it was because the, this universal program was so thoroughly racialized. And that's one of the reasons that, the, one of the things that single payer will have to confront if it wants to, uh, to win is to, you ca there can't be a way to do raceless social welfare in the United States. It's part of the politics of social welfare to have to take on those issues and those, those myths. Um, 
I, d I agree on the environment one in the back. I think we have a very uh, incredible moment and are likely to have a more incredible moment as the planet uh, collapses and as cities collapse uh, and as weather changes uh, that will present all kinds of new organizing uh, opportunities. I don't agree so much about the inevitable destruction of white supremacy. I think South Africa is still a white supremacist society. I, I think you, you can think in a place like South Africa of apartheid being the scaffolding on which white supremacy was built, but once it was built, the scaffolding is not so much necessary to keep white supremacy going in a place like South Africa. The, uh, I think there are a lot of questions about whether new populations will be admitted to the white race as they were in the 20th century, and so there'll still be a white majority in 2047 or wherever, whenever people are thinking there'll be a, a non-white United States in its majority. So I don't agree with that dimension of it. I'd just say really quickly um, that also, I don't think there's any guarantees of, or inevitable destruction of racism or capitalism that it's a, you know, it's a, it's a product of a political and ideological struggle. But I, I might disagree a little bit with David about the question of the social wage. Um, and, you know, because I think what, one of the things I've learned from anti-prison and anti-policing struggles is that, you know, and, and I, actually from Ann Braden, right? Uh -huh. She would talk about how white workers would think that the welfare state, you know, they wouldn't want to pay because it would go to black people, essentially, right? Yeah. But the problem is that they didn't understand that what bloats the state is all this expenditure and policing in prisons and, we might add, permanent war, right? And, you know, one of the things that we might think about and learn from these anti-police struggles um, and for the movement for black lives is how to redirect that wealth from policing, from prisons, and from war into the hands uh, of the working class. So in that way, I see no contradiction between an anti-racist demand to abolish the police state and prisons and warfare and universal redistributive programs. But, you know, we have to see, because we hadn't had it yet. We didn't get it in the 30s. Yeah. We yeah. didn't get it in the 60s. And I, I'm not citing the social democratic uh, precedents. Yeah. But I, I think it's an unfinished uh, project of, of abolition, and, and in that way, um, uh, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't agree more. So I think we'll take uh, maybe a handful more questions. All right, all the way over there. Excuse me. Uh, hi, thank you for the talk and thanks for coming. My name is David, and I just want to ask how you uh, would respond, um, David, to the, um, I think, very legitimate push, how the ruling class would respond, how the white working class has already kind of responded to the push for reparations, specifically and exclusively for the descendants of enslaved Africans. I mean, there's some talk about what form that would take. I don't think anybody is really looking for a check for individuals, but more institutionally, and how that would fit into your whole thesis. Um, I just wanted to reiterate a point that Helios brought up that was sort of alighted um, in the panel, but, um, and this is the identitarian point. Um, I, it's, I, I mean, I think it is true that, um, unfortunately, identity politics and the left in general is under attack in the United States um, and in the world. Um, and so I think that that sort of term of victimization is valid. At the same time though, um, Professor Murch, I think it was, um, the sort of divide that you spoke about between older activists, older um, activists of color and just activists in general, and our generation of activists, um, I think the reason, part of why that exists, it's not just an innocent um, lack of, um, class education in universities, um, but actually what I would say, unfortunately, I don't want to sound accusative, um, but actually in some cases a willful um, um, exclusion of the discussion of class and the consideration of class when we're saying I am oppressed. Um, and I think this has really dangerous consequences. I mean, in academia, this has taken queer theory into some weird places, so like queer negativity, you know, like telling people to let go of their agency when you know, like, you, you would not say that to, to someone who's never arguably had agency in the first place. It's clearly a classed way of looking at 
you know, queer theory and, but I, th but I think also has like larger consequences in like the, you know, the real world, if you, if you will, right? Um, and so I was wondering if you guys could talk a little bit more about that, about like identity politics as a valid concern versus identitarian politics, um, which is I think maybe what people who critique identity politics are really talking about, referring to. Thanks. Any other questions? I'll be brief. My name is Alana Lenton. I'm wondering, um, for those of you, because you mentioned Grenfell Tower, Christina, I was wondering for those of you who are perhaps looking at the UK, and I have an advanced copy of your book, uh, David, but unfortunately I haven't got to the part on Bernie Sanders yet, and I was wondering what you think about what I hear is a lot of optimism here in the US about Jeremy Corbyn, but what I'm hearing from anti-racists and people of color and black people in the UK at the moment is a lot of disappointment in the way in which he's seemingly, and I think this has been there since the beginning, I don't think this is any surprise, but seemingly playing to the right. So you'll be aware that a lot of people who voted for the UK Independence Party switched to Labour, and this is only growing um, with the current problems that we're seeing in the UK. And so there's a massive um, feeling of disappointment among people of colour and anti-racist that they've been let down uh, by this leader. And this makes me think that, you know, we need to ask serious questions about the possibilities of um, a social democratic project or indeed a Marxist project being truly anti-racist. And just one more right here. Um, I have to address that last comment. We, we know Jeremy very well and we've known him for 25 years and believe me, his problem is being surrounded by Trotsky's. I mean, that's his greatest problem. He's not, doesn't belong. But I'd like to address the question of um, doing this inside your country and outside your country. Um, Fred Jameson was my teacher at Harvard and he was fired for it. Uh, I left America in, in October of 67 and my friends were being shot here and my friends were being killed by death squads in Latin America. Uh, she left England and joined Prince of Latina in Cuba. Um, I knew the Hollywood 10 in Hampstead and when I met them, it, things were so underground and so heavy in America that it was as if I'd met the first decent Americans I'd ever met in my life. And to come back after 50 years and be sitting in this room, and I came back because nothing ever works abroad, I thought maybe it will work in America. And listening to you all, I feel it is working, actually. But I kind of wanted to ask you a question about the Universal Declaration, because the politics I knew, I've worked with 10 human rights groups, we had red brigades working in Amnesty, in the early stages of it, it was heavy, heavy politics. And that spoke to the world, that, that went everywhere. And a lot of them were hooked up also with people who were political in Hollywood 10, and that to me meant a great deal. And this seems to be surfacing in this country now. I mean, you're talking about something that's coming alive here. And when Americans do things, I think they do them better than anybody. But I mean, it, it has been, it, I mean, Zogby has written about this, the generation that voted for, that voted for Obama, the 18 to 25 year olds, they, you know, Obama, Zogby described them as more left wing than anything has ever been in the Republic. Now, I don't know whether you agree with this or not, but I mean, I'm just amazed to be sitting here and to be in a room full of, what, 110 people or something. I've never seen anything like this. This is something new to me. I've only been back here two months after 50 years out of the country, and I'm really moved, so I'm grateful to you. And thank you, Sophia, for the glass of water. That's the only thing I can say to her. I've never met her before, but at least she gave me a glass of water, so I'm grateful to her. Any comments you might make? I'm gonna be brief and let people have the last word. Um, thanks for that comment. And the comment in the back that, that started with these are confusing times, I want to be in solidarity with that as well. And, and maybe to put Donna's remark and, and your Zogby remark together is we have a generation of young people who are extraordinarily open to talking about socialism and don't necessarily uh, have opportunities yet to have learned very much uh, about socialism. So it is a, a confusing but also uh, promising moment. Uh, I'm a supporter of reparations. I think reparations are a working class demand. I think they're an example of a universal demand like Black Lives Matter that is uh, uh, both, both racially formed and a universal demand. Robin Kelly, uh, a long time ago, wrote a wonderful article about what if the labor movement supported reparations. Utopian socialist article, but it was still a wonderful, uh, it was a wonderful article, and, and it, it talked about how uh, reparations would revitalize parts of cities and make parts of cities able to resist gentrification in ways that benef would benefit all 
uh, working poor people uh, in cities. So a little bit of the book, and especially in its first uh, introduction, is about reparations and ta Coates and Sanders. Um, the, on the identitarian one, and I'm sorry I, that I missed that as your second question, um, I, I think that one of the, talking about self-criticisms, one of the mistakes that my work contains is to not be harder on liberal multiculturalism as an ideology. I think that liberal multi, so that in saying, in rejecting left critiques that move straight to universalism uh, out of hand, uh, that can sound like solidarity with liberal multiculturalism. Liberal multiculturalism is not anti-racism in any sense of the word. It's, it's about something very different, and it's about the production of difference. And so in that sense, I agree that if we, call, if we want to call that identitarianism, sure, I think. But I, I think we have to be very firm in saying there are all of these corporate things about in the world and educational institution things uh, that call themselves multiculturalism and that have no anti-racist aspirations at all and also ignore class. So I, I, I agree. Uh, and I, I'm afraid I don't know enough about the, the Corbin one uh, yet. Thanks. Um. Oh, thank you all for your questions. Really complicated um, and engaging. Um, I guess I'll start where David ended. One of the things, too, though, I think about diversity and liberal multiculturalism that's worth thinking about is not just them as ideologies, but them also as products. One of the things I think is important when we talk about diversity and liberal multiculturalism is not just thinking about them as ideologies that kind of float, but they're the products also in many ways of political defeat. I mean, they emerge as affirmative action is being dismantled. They emerged out of a fight for broader and more inclusive protections in the labor market, in the university, and I really think that matters. It's a kind of, you know, the, the defeat of many of the fights to extend, when thinking about the post-1965 moment when we were talking about not only legal incorporation, but how do we, you know, core parts of the black power movement were about the restructuring of the economy, and that included things like everything from provision of contracting and monies to local organizing groups to ways to think about the deep racialized political economy. And it's the defeat of these attempts to restructure the American economy and labor market that led to it. So that does matter. It's not just an idea that everyone, someone sprung up and said suddenly, I'm a liberal multiculturalist. You know, there was a process of corporate ap appropriation. At the same time, you were having the defeat of these organizations. So I think that that matters. I am uncomfortable with this language of identitarianism because it's, of course, um, as David Rodiger's work, its core lessons are about white nationalism. So identitarianism is a term that's often used to talk about, you know, s subject and marginalized populations. So, I, you know, I'm old enough, <laughs> unfortunately, to have lived through the debate about identity politics. This is the third time. And I just, it's like the great undead. I just wish it would die. It's imprecise. And it's imprecise because it allows us to attack something without naming it. And I'm very, very uncomfortable with that. So I think it's very important. If we don't like black power, we should say it. If we don't like Indian-based organizing, we should say it. If we don't like queer-based organizing, we should say it. The use of analogy is really a very, I think, can, can be a very destructive thing. So that said, depending on how old you are, what identity politics is means radically different things. I've had wonderful discussions with some of my colleagues, younger colleagues and graduate students about this. When I hear identity politics, I hear black power. I'm reliving the debates from the 1980s um, and still the attacks on the urban rebellions, you know? Um, that the way that that was used. Uh, other people talking about it today are talking about safe spaces and the privilege checking. Um, so it's very, very different. So I think we should try to name our politics more precisely and then have a really honest argument about how we feel about those politics. Something very quick I just wanted to say also about, you know, the 
the pitting against this abstraction called identity politics against re the redistributive state to me was the most unfortunate part of the Sanders campaign. I actively worked in that campaign. I even went to some of the rallies. Um, I wrote things in support of it. I was very, very critical of Hillary Clinton. And I've been utterly depressed in the aftermath of the election of watching, you know, try to build the base for redistributive politics against something called identity politics. When, when you look at the outcome of the election, it's precisely the most vulnerable populations that are being attacked. So as we're talking about, you know, kind of the building of new institutions to transmit leftist, because I like to think of Marxism as being very broad, epistemic community. I like to think of myself as a big tent leftist who likes many different kinds of tendencies. You know, that's something that we want to figure out. And I think that that's why David Rodiger's work has been so important for providing us through multiple historical studies in different time periods, ways to understand the deep intertwining of race, political economy, and class, and how you know to situate a, a critical interrogation of whiteness within uh, Marxism and political economy. I'll say this and then give Christine the last word. Um, I mean, the the concern I have is similar. You know, I worry that the critique of identitarianism can lend itself to saying, well, the problem is the people of color what done it, or it's the women what done it, or it's the queer trans people what done it. When the most cynical exploitation of identitarian politics is from Trump, is from Bannon, it's from the right, right? They're appealing to the sense of a besieged identity amongst whites who, you know, there's no Fordism, the kind of housing questions being pulled out from under them, and they're, you know, in a panic and anxiety about the future, and this white nationalist you know, um, appeal is an identitarian appeal. So if we want to critique identitarianism, let's focus our energies in towards of fighting white supremacy, right? And I think that would get us a lot further. I also think that socialists uh, ought to think through questions of struggles uh, against uh, unemployment that disproportionately falls on the backs of black and Latino workers as that's a class struggle, you know? Uh, when sex workers who are you know, uh, trans get criminalized, that's class struggle. When people are engaged in resistance to racist state violence, that's class struggle. That works a hell of a lot more effectively to link. We learned this from James. When, when people move, when the masses move and they confront a system of oppression, I think Marxists ought to try to move with them and uh, you know, do the theoretical work uh, accordingly. The future of socialism is linked to the self-activity and the struggles of uh, you know, the overwhelmingly and disproportionately black, Asian American, Native American, and poor white working class, right? So you know, with David, I think that rather than trying to say you know, race is defensive and if we only emphasize class the way that you know, some of our comrades on the socialist left do, that we ought to put it at the front and center. You know? and, and there's been exemplary ways that like, you know, trade unions went to Standing Rock. I thought that was really, uh, important, and we ought to, you know, build on that. Uh, you see unity between the fight for fa 15, which is not exactly a classical union, but still it's, you know, in alliance with um, the movement for black lives, and these are instances that um, I think are the, the future uh, and the present. Okay, here we go. I'll be brief. Um, I think a really important principle of socialism is that scarcity is a capitalist fantasy. We do have enough for everyone to be fed, to be clothed, to be loved, to be sustained, to be nurtured, even if we're convinced otherwise. The racist logic uh, that Dave talked about earlier that has dismantled the social wage is built on you know, both this imagining of scarcity and this capitalist sensibility, a kind of zero sum. If somebody gets something, it means somebody else has something taken away. And when these services are racialized, this produces the kind of vengeance of the, of, um, that I think we've talked a lot about today. So I don't want to be misunderstood, and I agree and you know, want to reaffirm what all the, my other panelists have said. In talking about the critique of identity politics, nobody's trying to confuse identitarianism um, with anti-racism, as David said. What my efforts today are intended to do are, are to say that when somebody is talking about racism, about 
race, gender, sexuality. And, and remember, like people speak in the categories that are available to them. It's not as if Marxism is an available uh, a, 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 a grammar to people. People are trying to make sense of the world they're in with the categories available to them. And if we feel like our impulse, if the knee-jerk reaction is to think that in speaking about any of those categories, any of those forms of oppression, we are taking away space to talk about class, that same zero-sum imaginary, I think that that reproduces a capitalist sensibility. So not only do we have to have a more generous and capacious kind of socialist logic, I think we have to have a, a socialist sensibility that's more patient, that's more generative, that calls in rather than calls out. And I'll just repeat what I said before, the point is not to be right, the point is to get free. Thank you.